Like most organized crime groups, the Mafia is shrouded in mystery and expensive designer suits. Even after being brought to its knees by the FBI and the RICO law, many of the activities of the Mafia remain unknown to most people. Even big fans of their Mafia-themed movies seeking a bit more meaning and understanding to what they have seen. Our video today exposes the top 10 unknown facts about the Mafia. Without further ado, let's begin. Number 10. Position of the Mafia on Drugs Drugs were outlawed in the American Mafia. Can you believe that? Did you know that there are several tape recordings of conversations between high-ranking members of the biggest Mafia families obtained by the FBI as proof of this fact? And what was the penalty for drugs? Members accused or suspected of drug trafficking would be killed on the spot. There was no need for any clearance, explanations, or protocol. Any made man suspected of drug trafficking was immediately killed. This was because it was assumed that any made man involved in drug trafficking was prone to becoming an informant for the FBI. However, that didn't stop several made men, and even popular mafia families like the Camorra and Ingrangheta, who were heavily involved in drug trafficking and had it as their main source of income. However, researchers and law enforcement agencies have taken different stands on this subject. While some believe that that a number of the American mafias stopped dealing drugs for diverse reasons, either morality or worry about double agents, another group believes that this story is nothing but a myth, arguing that drug trafficking is undoubtedly a core part of the mafia's wealth. Number 9. Membership Requirements While most people had an idea of the requirements to become a made man, some rumors may have been untrue. For example, because the Mafia has its roots in Sicily, the largest island in the Mediterranean in Italy, most people assume that you had to be Sicilian to join the Mafia or become a made man. In an earlier video, we talked a bit more about the general structure of the Mafia and how made men were selected, so be sure to check it out. You'd you don't need to be from Sicily to become a made man, but you had to be Italian, which means your father had to be Italian. To become made in the American Mafia, the inductee had to be a male of full Sicilian heritage, which was shortly expanded to men of full Italian descent and eventually extended to males of at least half Italian descent through their father's lineage. For example, despite his vast Mafia career and his mother's Sicilian ancestry, prominent Lucchese family associate Henry Hill was unable to become a made man since his father was Irish. However, John A. Gotti, the son of Italian-American mobster John Gotti, whose maternal grandmother was Russian, and Frank Saleme of the New England Patriarca crime family, whose mother was of Irish origin, are instances of made members who are not of completely Italian descent. Number 8. The Camorra Family from Naples The Camorra family has its origins in the Campania area of Naples. It is one of Italy's oldest and greatest criminal groups, going all the way back to the 17th century. The Camorra organization is organized into distinct factions, known as clans. Every capo or boss is the leader of a clan, which may have tens or hundreds of affiliates, depending on the strength and structure of the clan. As a result of their independence, Camorra clans are prone to conflict among themselves. The major businesses of the Camorra include drug trafficking, racket racketeering, counterfeiting, and money laundering. It is also not uncommon for Camorra clans to penetrate local politics. Because of the structure of the Camorra family, though smaller in number compared to some of the major mafia families, they are known to be brutal. Also, Camorra clans are known for infiltrating the political system of the province where they are stationed. Therefore, it isn't particularly uncommon to have strong Camorra members as a part of the government. This gives them the power to slightly tilt the law in their favor, giving them access that would typically be inexistent. Number 7. The Indrangheta from Calabria The Indrangheta, like the Camorra, is a powerful Italian, mafia-style organized crime syndicate and criminal organization that dates back to the late 18th century and is located in the peninsular and hilly area of Calabria. It is regarded as one of the world's most powerful
powerful organized crime syndicates. Following widespread emigration from Calabria in the 1950s, the group spread around the world. It is distinguished by a horizontal organization of independent clans, known as Indrine, which are nearly entirely based on family relationships. Its primary business is drug trafficking, which it controls across Europe, but it also engages in arms trafficking, money laundering, racketeering, extortion, loan sharking, and prostitution. For decades, the Indrangheta has had a special relationship with the major South American cartels, which see it as their most trustworthy European partner. It can dramatically influence local and national politics and infiltrate huge segments of the legal economy. According to a Demoscopica Research Institute report, they made 53 billion euros in 2013. According to a U.S. official, the organization's drug trafficking, extortion, and money laundering operations contributed to at least 3% of Italy's GDP in 2010. Number 6. The Biggest Mafia Group While there are several mafia groups, the biggest mafia group is, without a doubt, the Sicilian Mafia, popularly known as La Cosa Nostra, meaning this thing of ours. The Sicilian Mafia was the first to get to the United States and is naturally the model for all other mafia organizations. Currently, the Sicilian Mafia is rumored to have over 5,000 members, with a major chunk of those members currently living living in Sicily, Italy. This large membership allows the Mafia to continue its age-old crime structures, which typically revolves around racketeering, illegal gambling, drug trafficking, money laundering, and robbery. And while the Italian Mafia group might have lost the prestigious holding it used to have in Italy and the United States, the activities of this group are still ongoing in both countries. Today, the group still controls certain territories in Italy, including Calabria, Campania, and of course, Sicily. All business owners in these provinces are required to pay pizza, and failure to do this could result in something violent, so business owners like this would rather live with a permanent law enforcement escort. Number 5. Naming of the U.S. Mafia Families When it comes to Mafia families, there is no definite name standard. Early families were called after the region or town where they originated in Italy. The family's name might occasionally change to the boss's name, especially if he was a powerful or long-serving boss. The testimony of Joe Valacci before a Senate subcommittee in 1963 cemented the identities of the five major New York City families. The families were named after the present leaders. However, the name was taken from a former, more powerful boss in one case. These are the Bonanno, Genovese, Gambino, Lucchese, and Profaci families. A few years later, Joseph Colombo took over the Profaci family, becoming so well known that the family is now referred to as the Colombo family. When John Gotti took over the Gambino family, the same thing almost happened. However, before becoming the Gotti family, Gotti was caught and convicted of racketeering and murder partly on the evidence of Mafia traitor Sammy the Bull Gravano. Law enforcement agencies refer to this family as the Gambino crime family. To date, a number of Mafia families get their names from the city they originated from. Number 4. The Smallest Mafia Group Sacra Corona Unita, meaning United Sacred Crown, is the smallest Mafia family from Puglia, a small city in the southeastern part of Italy. They are known to be smugglers, smuggling all sorts from Eastern Europe. Camorra boss Raffaele Cutolo established the Sacra Corona Unita in 1981 as the Nuova Grande Camorra Pugliese to expand his activities into the Italian region of Apulia following Cutolo's demise a few years later. The group resumed operating independently under Giuseppe Rogoli. The Apulian crime boss was inspired by various Calabrian Indrangheta leaders imprisoned in the Trani jail on the coast north of Bari, the region's capital, to form a new criminal organization based in Apulia, with himself at the helm. The Sacra Corona Unita, which has roughly 50 clans and 2,000 members, specializes in smuggling cigarettes, cocaine, guns, and people. The Sacra Corona Unita receives bribes from various criminal organizations in exchange for landing privileges on Italy's southeast coast. When conducting its organization, the SCU employs a hierarchical system. The higher you climb, the more responsibility and money you receive. The group's prominent rulers are men. Recently, the SCU has discovered new methods to abuse people online by defrauding them for money. 
Number three, when the books were opened, the membership books of the Mafia were locked in 1957 to prevent criminals acting as informants for law enforcement authorities from becoming members of Mafia groups. According to one Mafia informant, Joseph Valachi, the move came after a succession of arrests of high-level figures, including Vito Genovese, the country's most powerful Mafia boss at the time. While many believe the books were opened between 1976 and 1977, they were in fact opened in the early 70s. Vincent the Fish Cafaro, a Mafia soldier who became a cooperating witness after his arrest, confessed that he was made in 1974 when the books were opened. Michael Francese, the popular son of former underboss Sonny Francese, asserted he was made in 1975. The problem of informing is, as you already guessed, a critical one for the Mafia. Several Mafia bosses, such as Joe Valachi, Joseph Messina, and Salvatore Gravano are some of the high-ranking Mafia bosses who snitched on their former associates. While some of these men died in prison, a few others were released and subsequently killed. A few others survive to this day, either in hiding or under extreme protection by law enforcement. Number 2. The Real Boss of the Genovese Family The Genovese family is one of the Big Five families that dominate organized crime activity in New York and New Jersey. The Genovese family is the most ancient and powerful of the five families. Charles Lucky Luciano formed the present family, known as the Luciano Crime Family, from 1931 to 1957, when it was renamed after boss Vito Genovese. The family was in control of the west side of Manhattan's waterfront, the docks, and the Fulton Market on the East River waterfront. The family was run secretly for years by Vincent the Chin Gigante, who pretended to be insane by shuffling through New York's Greenwich Village, wearing a tattered bathrobe and muttering incoherently to avoid prosecution. Gigante took over in 1981, but didn't want any exposure, so it was assumed that Fat Tony was the leader of the Genovese family, but he was the cover for the true boss, Vincent Gigante. Interesting fact, Gigante didn't set out to be a mafia boss. In fact, between the years of 1944 to 1947, he was a boxer who fought over 25 fights. Number 1. Gregory Scarpa was an FBI informant. Gregory Scarpa, also known as the Mad Hatter and the Grim Reaper, was an American capo regime hitman for the Colombo crime family and eventually an FBI informant. Scarpa was the primary enforcer and seasoned hitman for Colombo leader Carmine Persico in the 1970s and 1980s. The FBI believes he murdered at least 100 individuals throughout his criminal career. It is believed that FBI field agents in Mississippi hired Scarpa in the summer of 1964 to assist them in the search for missing civil rights workers, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner. The FBI was confident the three men had been murdered, but they could not locate their remains. The agents believed Scarpa might obtain this information from suspects using unlawful interrogation tactics not available to agents. However, this Scarpa story was never formally confirmed by the FBI. Scarpa allegedly assisted the FBI a second time in Mississippi in January 1966 on the murder investigation of Vernon Dahmer, who was murdered in a Klan set fire. Scarpa and the FBI disagreed on his reward for these services after this, and he was then dropped as a confidential informant by the FBI.